Hello, and welcome to Fostering Connections with the Natural World, a Biophilic Cities webinar series. I'm Amanda Beck, a research associate with the Biophilic Cities Project at the University of Virginia. Through this series, we will hear from practitioners and researchers who are creating healthier communities, healthier landscapes, and healthier people through increased connections with nature. The Biophilic Cities Project started at UVA in 2011 to explore and advance nature in cities. In the fall of 2013, the Global Biophilic Cities Network was launched, with partner cities spanning the globe from San Francisco, California, Wellington, New Zealand, and Singapore. This series is one way the Biophilic Cities Project aims to help share knowledge about the innovative work of cities, organizations, and individuals around the world who are championing biophilic design. To see the full schedule of topics and to register for an upcoming webinar, please visit our website at www biophiliccities.org backslash registration. Today we'll hear from Dr. Wallace J. Nichols, a research associate at the California Academy of Sciences and the co-founder of several groups such as OceanRevolution.org, an international network of young ocean advocates, and LiveBlue.org, a global campaign to reconnect us to our watery planet. He has authored and co-authored more than 50 scientific papers and reports and is the recent New York Times bestselling author of Blue Mind. Currently, Dr. Nichols and his team are working on the Blue Mind Collective, which merges the fields of cognitive science and aquatic exploration, the goal of which is increasing appreciation for healthy water, waterways and oceans. Dr. Nichols will speak for 30 minutes to be followed by questions from the audience. So I will go ahead and let you take it away, Dr. Nichols. Great. Thanks a lot, Amanda. And hello to everybody. Um, we will uh, make the best of, of this lack of eye contact. Um, hopefully the, uh, the slides will, will suffice for visual stimulation. Uh, I wanted to put my contact information up first. If, if you want to email with any, any questions and follow-ups on uh, any of the research I touch on or any, any of the ideas, or any of the images, just please get in touch. Um, my, my Twitter handle, and we use the hashtag BlueMind uh, as it relates to this, this conversation. Um, really excited to be connected with uh, the Biophilic Cities Project and uh, with Amanda and with Tim Beatley. Uh, I was able to go out to UVA and, and speak uh, about uh, Blue Mind, the book, and um, had lots of great conversations with, with the faculty and and students there, and um, I hope this connection between blue urbanism and blue mind continues. And that's really the, the thing I want to touch on today is uh, the blue mind journey, the, the, the process that took me from um, being a, a marine biologist to um, sitting here today talking about um, biophilic cities. And I, I like to just remind people that we are, in fact, a, a blue planet. Uh, although the green parts tend to get most of our attention, uh, the, the discussion about green space in urban areas is, is much more advanced than, than the discussion of blue space. But that's beginning to change and in some really exciting ways, uh, thanks to the work that uh, you, you've heard about already through this series and, um, and Tim Beatley's book, Blue Urbanism. So, I find it to be an interesting and provo provocative way to start um, all of my conversations with a simple question, uh, what's your water? And, um, and I leave that kind of open-ended and ask people to consider, you know, what, what is that water that you connect with most, maybe on a daily basis, perhaps it's the place you go to relax, maybe it's the place you fell in love with water the first time. Um, what, what's your water? And uh, I'll just let you think about that for a second. Uh, for some people, it's you know a wilder waterway, perhaps a, a river, where they're uh, able to you know, get their adventurous spirit going. Maybe it's the ocean. Maybe it's up in the bow of a, of a boat. Um, perhaps seeing a scene like this, you know, when you're in the bow of the boat and the dolphins show up, it's always a, a fantastic moment. Uh, for a lot of us, water means connecting with friends and family, with, with those we love. Some of uh, our best memories are, are formed when we're together, um, 
with those we care about and we're spending time near or, or in water, as the case may be. Maybe something as simple as the, the water that comes out of our tap. Uh, I remember back in grade school waiting in, waiting in line to get a drink out of the water fountain and how good that water tasted when I finally, uh, it was finally my turn to, to push the button and stand there and uh, it just tasted so good and felt so good. And then you got back online again, perhaps to get another, another shot at it, another drink. But you know, just a simple, a simple sip of water could be uh, a really important part of your water memories. But for a lot of people, it's that combination between the edge of the water and the built environment. Uh, perhaps a, a city pier like this one uh, in the UK, uh, which actually burned down this past year and of course uh, will likely be rebuilt uh, because it holds so many fond memories for so many people through so many generations. Uh, perhaps it's a, you know, a less wild waterway. This is a rooftop pool in Singapore. Um, clearly a relaxing spot for those who are able to, to go there and perhaps afford the, that luxury. Um, for some, their water is much more uh, internal, perhaps uh, the bathroom. This is Jack Black, and I think his, his water is his, his bathtub, uh, where he likes to spend time with his dog. And uh, our water, the answer to that question varies from person to person. For me, when I think about my water and where I fell in love with water, I, I always think of my father. And I think of the times that we spent throughout our lives connecting with each other and connecting with our water, um, traveling, uh, learning to swim, riding on his back in the water. I think of time spent in the mountains by, by lakes and the very deep memories that have been formed, um, spending time near those waters. And I think back on my childhood playing uh, in the Chesapeake Bay and connecting with sea turtles, which was kind of the thing I was mostly interested in it as a kid, kind of obsessed with turtles. And I turned that obsession into a career as a marine biologist. And I've worked with people around the world to protect sea turtles, to uh, study them, to work to bring them back from the brink of extinction. And through that work, I learned that working with people uh, was going really to be the only way that we were going to protect turtles. And working with unexpected allies, such as uh, this man, whose name is Chewy Lucero, who grew up hunting and eating sea turtles, and now is one of the, the fiercest sea turtle protectors on the planet. I remember as a student talking about that part of conservation with my, my committee member, my graduate school committee members. And I remember them saying, well, that, you know, that touchy-feely human dimension stuff really just put that to the side and, and focus on the science. And I remember being a bit frustrated back then, you know, say 15, 20 years ago, at the lack of, of links between these feelings about water and these feelings about nature and wildlife and science. And since then, I started to, to try to connect the dots and to reach in different directions, uh, to try to better understand the connection between us and each other, uh, between us and wild nature, uh, between us and our, the watery parts of the world. And when I started looking around, I realized there, there was um, some science, but it was pretty spread out and not really um, brought together. The book I was hoping to read hadn't been written yet, uh, and I was really unsuccessful in trying to convince anybody else to to write it. But essentially the idea is that it's worth understanding our brains on water. It's worth digging deeper into the science, into the neuroscience, uh, the neuropsychology, the cognitive biology as it relates to the blue space. As we look back on, on the history of understanding the brain, we realize that we treated it largely like a black box. We, we weren't able to open the lid and look inside. But that's changing. It's changed really drastically in the past decade or two. We're now able to look at the human brain uh, as it's being used, 
as it's interacting with its environment, whether that's a green space, blue space, or built space. And we're able to ask a really interesting set of questions about our brains on water, for example. Now, if you look back, this is a graph from a couple of years ago. If you look back on the intersection between neuroscience and various fields of, of inquiry, uh, if you look back on you know, research on applied neuroscience, you find that neuroscience is intersected with a lot of different areas of our lives, from sleep to health uh, to mood, sexual behavior, sports, art, religion, learning, teaching, on and on and on. But what you really don't find much of is our brain on nature. In particular, you don't find much that relates our neuroscience to water, which happens to be the majority of our planet. So Blue Mind has been largely uh, the art of connecting dots and looking at, say, the neuroscience of meditation and wondering how that may relate to our understanding of blue space. Looking at the neuroscience of music and relaxation and creativity and happiness and connecting the dots to water, to this, this field, marine biology and aquatic conservation. And by doing that, we've started a, a different kind of conversation that's been really fascinating and, and intersects, of course, with uh, this theme of biophilic cities and blue urbanism. And it brings us to the, you know, the what, why, and how. So what have, we, what have we learned? Why is it important? And how might we apply the intersection between water and cognitive science? So first, recognizing that most of our planet uh, is water on the surface, but it really represents, a, volume-wise, a, a very fragile and, and surprisingly small amount of our planet. That large marble is, is all of the water. The smaller one is all of the fresh water, and the very, very small one is the accessible, useful fresh water. So that graphic just puts it in perspective. We, we are a water planet, in fact, but our water is, is quite limited and, and, and being so quite fragile. We need to really understand that, that situation, although sometimes it seems like water is so abundant. It really is something we need to be very careful of. And when we understand water, we think of this list. We think of jobs, food, energy, hydration, biodiversity. These are the ecosystem services that, that come from healthy aquatic systems, healthy waterways, very important parts of our lives. But this is a, a really a massively incomplete list. And I'll explain why I mean why I say that. When ecologists think about water, we think about trophic cascades. We think about how replacing top predators can adjust the ecosystem. So by that, I'm referring to re replacing the, the wolves in Yellowstone and how that changes the prey, which changes the, the uh, plant community, which adjusts and changes the, the river ecosystem. Or restoring sharks to a coral reef and a similar kind of cascade that occurs. And ecologists also think of ecosystem services, that list of, of uh, services and benefits that we get from healthy waterways. But what we should also be thinking about are the neurologic cascades and the emotional services. And by that, I mean those moments when you know, the, the restored river inspires somebody to get more involved, to reconnect with themselves, with their surroundings. Um, when scuba diving on a coral reef and seeing the biodiversity, somebody gets out of the ocean and says, wow, well, I, I want to be a marine biologist. I want to work for the protection of these places. And along with that are the emotional services, not just the ecosystem services, but the emotional services, those that occur inside of us when we respond to these green spaces and blue spaces. And in the world I, I spend my time in, these aspects are often overlooked or downplayed or you know, completely left out of the conversation. So a place like Pittsburgh, where the river is beginning to come back, you see not only the ecological services provided by a healthy river re returning and the trophic cascade that occurs in a healthy ecosystem, 
but you also see the neurologic cascades. When people gather at the point for ceremonies, for events, for field trips, they fall more in love with each other, they fall more in love with their city, they fall more in love with the waters around them, and all of the emotional services that are provided by healthy urban water and healthy rural water as well. So these are cognitive, emotional, psychological and, and social benefits that we get from healthy waterways. And they're beginning to be easier to study. Now, 10 years ago, it was kind of people would roll their eyes at this conversation. That's changed quite a bit. And our, the tools and, and the, the techniques that are available to us to study this aspect of, of life, and this aspect of water, are, are really pretty exciting. I call the, the broad conversation neuroconservation, which is kind of a mashup of neuroscience and biodiversity conservation. And it, it's, a, I guess, a novel term. And um, I think it's a really interesting place to, to spend some time poking around. And uh, some might call it eco-psychology or environmental psychology. And uh, that's, those are good terms as well. But the basis of it is the basic idea that healthy green space and blue space are, in fact, medicine. Uh, they're sometimes better than uh, the pharmaceuticals that are available to us. And when we have healthy green space and blue space, uh, it leads to uh, healthier cities, healthier communities, uh, healthier families, healthier individuals. And that's something that the medical uh, community healthcare community is beginning to really understand and lean into as well. So we live in an, an increasingly busy uh, world full of devices and information, traffic perhaps, um, the built environment, uh, interactions with, with people we may not want to always interact with. And that's a, a red mind state. And while red mind is important to getting things done, if it's our only state of mind, we begin to break down. Our bodies begin to break down. Our cells, even our DNA, our neurons, begin to suffer. So I, I present the idea that I call blue mind, which is the mildly meditative, more relaxed state that your, your brain shifts into when you're at the edge of, of water or when you're floating on the water, even in or under the water. It's something we all know. It, it can be a the interaction with a glass of water or a bathtub, all the way up to something as large as the Pacific Ocean. And the more we appreciate that it's a, a very real phenomenon and that it's good for us, good for our communities, the more hopefully we will take care of it. So this is not a new idea by any means. Artists throughout history have understood this connection to water, the emotional pull and the power of water images. Uh, this is Rand Ortner, who is a, a contemporary um, artist, and he paints, he's a good friend, paints the surface of the water in these very large um, triptychs that fill a room. And his paintings are, are incredibly powerful, and they just depict the surface, the water surface. So there's an emotional connection to water that is undeniable something that poets have always known. Uh, Pablo Neruda, Necesito del mar porque me enseña. I need the sea because it teaches me. And Mary Oliver, referring to the imagination and the creativity through this water metaphor, the pond, the river, the harbor, all these watery metaphors throughout poetry and prose pop up over and over again. Even the New Yorker understands that that water gazing is a, a multi-generational activity that many of us uh, enjoy and have enjoyed throughout our lives. Just the mere act of standing at the edge of the water and looking out is something that uh, humans have probably done since the beginning of humanity. Corona Beer even understands the dynamic and they've based their, their brand around the idea that humans like to look at water. Uh, quite, a, quite a bold thing for them to do back in the day, but it seems to have worked out quite well for them. Uh, there's little Leo DiCaprio uh, in the bow of the Titanic. He feels like he's the, the king of the world, and he's looking out on, on the vast North Atlantic. 
And then he returns to that same spot with his girlfriend, and they uh, experience romance up, up in the bow of the ship. Now, if I continue the Titanic story, the whole thesis falls apart, so I'm just going to leave it right there. Um, but needless to say, Hollywood has always understood the romantic pull and the emotional pull of water. If you imagine this scene from Here to Eternity without the water, it really is not at all the same. Uh, it would just be a couple people in their bathing suits rolling around in the dirt, uh, not nearly as compelling as rolling around next to the edge of the ocean. Architecturally and city, from a city planning point of view, we understand that water is part of um, a good city. And this is Modesto, California, depicting on the way into the city. Water, wealth, contentment, which is another word for happiness, and health. I think that's a, a wonderful juxtaposition of, of words. And this is a sign that was uh, put up uh, in 1912. So it's, again, it's not a new idea. Uh, I took a trek down the California coast um, a few years back, about a, a decade ago, and I, and I just have this one shot of this house. It's an 800-square-foot bungalow on the beach in Del Mar, California. And the asking price in summer of 2003 was $6.3 million. And if you look at the, the bigger context, you realize that waterfront homes will pull a, an incredible premium. Uh, in, in the case of Del Mar, California, it's a 1,000% premium between the front row and the second row. There's something really compelling about being right at the edge of the water that people are, are willing to pay a lot for. There's a little closer up of, of that, that effect. Uh, so you've got 10 to $20 million homes on the, in the front row, and then it drops drastically to the se second row. Uh, that, that front row is, is really a, a valuable place, and it's because of the proximity to the water that people really want. Now, this is not just a coastal story. It's, a, it's an all-water story. It's all about lakes and rivers and creeks as well as bays and oceans, even ponds and uh, uh, built water, so constructed ponds and fountains as well, will add to the value and, and add to our well-being. This is an ancient idea that, that water is, in fact, medicine. And I think we are beginning to back that up uh, with good science. As it emerges, I think this is a very exciting time uh, for this conversation. I'm going to give you a few, just a few examples of, of friends and colleagues and their relationships to water. Um, Dr. Oliver Sacks, one of the most beloved neurologists of all time, his favorite place for thinking is in the water. He tries to swim every day, and he claims that he gets his best ideas in the water. His creativity is boosted by uh, time spent in the water. In fact, he, he keeps a, a write, in, write in the rain or a waterproof notebook at the edge of, of the lake or the pool so that he can get his ideas on paper after he's gone for a swim. Naoki Higashida, a young man from Japan who, who wrote this book, um, bestseller called The Reason I Jump, uh, about his, his life with autism. And what he says in that book is that in the water, he feels free and happy, uh, unlike the way he feels when he's out of the water, where life is, is stressful and stimulating and confusing. Uh, I think we can all relate to that on some level, perhaps not as, as severely and, and at the same extreme as Neoki, but I think we all have that experience. And the, the third person I want to introduce you to is, is Martin Pollock. Uh, he's a, um, a veteran. Uh, he's a, a, a British guy who returned from Afghanistan and uh, came back without his legs and missing one arm. Um, thought he was going to spend his life in the pub drinking, uh, drinking with his mates. And he got hooked up with a group called Operation Surf and really found his direction, found his passion, and became inspired to continue to work on his health. And now he's a, an ambassador for uh, the protection of, of surf spots and the healing power of, of the ocean. And there he is surfing with 
Um, that's a guy named Flea, whose nickname is Flea on the right. He's a, a pro surfer. And um, Martin's friend there with the red hair. Uh, and then the surf instructor with the hat on, uh, holding his boards in the water, is Van Carraza. And uh, Martin is really an inspiration. And he, like many others around the world, are finding that their rivers, lakes, and oceans are, are a source of healing and a place to, to recover from some serious injuries. Uh, if folks are interested in, in more research on, on blue space and how it uh, intersects with the fields of psychology, uh, geography, and neuroscience, a great place to look is uh, the work of Matthew White at the University of Exeter Medical School. So this all really hinges at, on access. If you can't get to the water uh, for whatever reason, this blue mind benefit goes away, goes without saying. Uh, things that limit access might be the, cl the closing down of, of roads and pathways, um, you, know, you know, privatization of the coast or of the edge of water. Uh, it limits public access. A physical access can be limited if, if people with uh, limited mobility are, are unable to get to the water. And there are ways around that, of course, uh, by making uh, paths uh, handicap accessible. Pollution can block our access. You may be able to get to the water, but if you get there and it's full of oil or polluted by plastic or other chemicals, uh, it really is, is not accessible. That's, that wave is not uh, a surfable or swimmable wave. It's, it's a deadly wave. And then perception limits people from getting in the water. And some, some cultures are told that you know, they're, they're not supposed to go in the water. In some parts of the world, women are told that they're not supposed to surf or swim or even wear a swimsuit outside. And those are, are things that are, are changing. This is our, our friend, Carlos, who lives in Mozambique and grew up being told that his people weren't supposed to go in the water. And now he's uh, the first Mozambican dive master, and he's uh, helping people connect with their oceans and their coast in really wonderful ways. So that, uh, that perception is, is an issue. And of course, you may be able to get to the water. The water may be um, clean, and there, there may be no cultural limitations. But sometimes people get there, and they're so distracted by technology that they really aren't there at all. Uh, they're walking down the beach uh, looking at their smartphone uh, rather than disconnecting and, and uh, reconnecting with themselves and their loved ones. So we see that as a, a more and more common phenomenon. To which I say, maybe switch out that smartphone with a baby turtle once in a while and uh, leave the technology behind and, and connect with, with your, your waterway or your coast and with the nature around you. So to sum up, the, is this list of, of, of um, emotional services or benefits that we get when we experience the edge of the water, whether it's in our cities or in remote places. Um, among them is, is this feeling of awe or wonder. And there's a, a growing body of science on the science of awe, which suggests that the feeling of awe really changes our brains. It, it puts us into a different mode. And in, in the most simple way to explain it, uh, it switches us from a, a me perspective to a we perspective, which opens us up for um, more compassion and more empathy. And this is something that is, is uh, increasingly well studied. In fact, we're beginning to understand exactly where these feelings, these emotions uh, occur or where they emanate from in our brains. And we know that compassion is incredibly important for for our future. If we, if we lack empathy and compassion, uh, we're really in big trouble. So awe is one of the emotions that leads to the building of compassion and the building of empathy. We should generate more of it. But the flip side of that is, a, is the consideration of a, a life without awe, uh, which is something that is um, quite sad to even contemplate. But that sense of, of awe leads to compassion and empathy. It, it helps to build trust. And conversations by the water, time spent by the water, 
certainly build trust between individuals. Maybe it's one of the reasons why people hold their most important ceremonies, oftentimes at the edge of the water or at the edge of, of nature or in, immersed in nature. Uh, perhaps that's why people take their honeymoons by the water uh, to build that relationship and build trust. As we saw with the Oliver Sacks example, water can offer creativity as well. Uh, mind wandering, just stepping away from the desk and the computer and perhaps looking out at water can help us jar things, uh, open things up, uh, shake things loose, uh, gives us inspiration, creativity, and, and sometimes leads to those aha moments that give us the big ideas that help solve problems. Of course, solitude is, is enhanced when we're by water. And a, uh, a recent study out of the UVA uh, Department of Psychology, um, authored by Tim Wilson and his colleagues and students, uh, showed that this feeling of solitude may be something that uh, the younger generation is, is uh, in need of learning uh, a bit more about. Um, the generation, perhaps, that's always connected, uh, the device that keeps you always uh, connected, always social. Um, does not allow for, for this feeling of solitude. And along with solitude comes privacy. And again, in a, a busy city and in, in this connected world, the feeling of privacy is ever more important. Being able to get away and have a, a private conversation, uh, just perhaps even with yourself <laughs> or with a, a small group of people uh, or with your loved one uh, is incredibly important. And being by the water is, is one way to experience privacy. Uh, romance, something about what being by water uh, generates romance. Um, it's, it's hard to say exactly what it is, but it, it probably has to do with the trust, the compassion, the empathy, uh, the privacy, the solitude that we experience at the edge of the water. And of course, who people associate most with their, their water breaks, their vacations, is relaxation. Relaxation being incredibly important for our health, given that 60% of uh, health conditions are related to stress. And so really being able to disconnect and uh, relax, reduce stress, is important for, for public health. Some of our best memories are formed by water. And uh, those memories that are extremely emotional, we, we call nostalgia. And uh, I, I think about my most nostalgic moments. And I think about my kids' nostalgia. And I wonder about kids who, whose nostalgia is connected to, more to apps and iTunes than to nature. And I wonder what that translates to down the road. And of course, the whole thing hinges on love and um, the love of, of our, our place, the love of, of our, uh, our families and, and friends, and love of nature. And uh, I, I think there's very little hope for restoring the natural world if it's uh, not based in one way or another in, in falling in love uh, with our surroundings. Uh, generating that those innovative ideas requires new people getting together. And that's really what this Biophilic Cities conversation is all about. It's about new ideas, uh, combining new concepts and, and new fields and coming up with uh, different ways of of understanding our cities, understanding our, our, our nature, understanding our water. And that's what this book, Blue Mind, has, has been all about. Uh, and just a, a marine biologist who was curious about how and why people fall in love with the ocean and with sea turtles. And that's led uh, to a, a, a fantastic set of collaborations and uh, a changing of the way we describe ecosystem services, and adding to the list, and recognizing that all of these things are important. And as we begin to define and understand the list on the right, it, uh, it adds to our appreciation of, of what healthy water is, is really all about. And my hope is to take this conversation out of the bathroom and out of the lake house and really bring it into the boardroom and into the White House and make it business and policy relevant. Uh, take it out of 
out of the, the poetry realm and out of the artistic realm, add some rigorous science to it, and go through the front door uh, of the most important meetings, uh, which is really why uh, I'm thrilled to be invited to, to speak at the Biophilic Cities uh, conversation. So I'll, I'll end there with um, that simple reminder that we, we live on a, on a water planet. We live on a, a little blue marble, as the NASA astronauts refer to it. And as we begin to understand more about our emotional connections to water, uh, that will supplement our, our better understanding of our, our biological and physical and economic connections to water and hopefully change the conversation for the better. So thanks a lot for listening so far, and I'm happy to, to chat. Um, Thank you, Dr. Nichol. And, and follow up uh, um, anytime. So some questions. Um, uh, more of the details. Uh, what connections design, do you see uh, between uh, water conscious designs, like fire okay. flails, blue waves, daylighted streams, and helping urban residents prepare for and adapt to climate change? Um, you mentioned a fisherman earlier in your presentation, and his livelihood is completely dependent on the ocean. Uh, but if he cares more about the health of the ocean and its ecosystem, it benefits all of us, including this livelihood. Yeah, that's a good question. The, the, um, there's, this, there's a positive feedback loop, I think. Um, if people are completely disconnected from their ocean or um, their, their urban waterways, then they're less likely to be involved or open to the changes that are ahead. Uh, so that's what we, we saw with the group of fishermen we've worked with um, throughout Mexico. Uh, and we brought back uh, sea turtles in in western Mexico from the brink of extinction, um, not because of a, we had a, a great pile of science, but because we had a great grassroots team of people who participated all along. So they understood and were connected to the, the whole picture, the, the whole dynamic, and making hard decisions uh, for them, which may have involved not eating a sea turtle on a special event, made more sense. So I think the same, same thing is true for urban design. If, if people begin to understand uh, the water that flows through their city, um, whether it's, it's the, you know, the water runoff or the river or the ocean front, and they're engaged with it more, and they see it, and they understand it, and they understand what it, what it gives to them, then when they're asked to give something back, I think you have a, a, a better chance. You have maybe more political momentum, and your solutions, and even the hard solutions, are more likely to be, be acceptable. Uh, and I, so I think that as a, as a general concept is, is, um, is probably true. Uh, what often happens, say in the case of sea turtles, is um, people are not asked to participate in the research. Uh, the laws are made far away in the capital city, and then they're sort of imposed on someone they don't understand why or how. Uh, they don't understand who did the work and who made the laws. And so it's a, it's a top-down, outside uh, implementation that is, is often pretty rigid and more often than not unsuccessful because the resources for enforcement are not uh, available. Um, so again, the, the, it's a sea turtle case study, but I think it has applications to all of the the work that we're doing that, that relates to uh, change, the changes that are ahead. What has been the so, reaction to your research supporting these positive emotional uh, and psychological outcomes from being and your nature? Our, our, and do you work at all to help educate coastal city councilors uh, to kind of get them thinking about this sort of issue and what they can do? Yeah, I've had a lot of conversations uh, with um, uh, political leaders in, in coastal communities, but, but you know, at the at the local level and at the state level, um, they're 
you know, their question is always, how do I make this policy relevant? How do I bring this in the front door and, and communicate uh, to, to my colleagues um, the emotional side of this conversation? And, um, and you know, there, there are ways to do that, especially as it intersects with healthcare. care. That, that quickly makes its, its case uh, when, when you realize that uh, waterside and water-based, uh, nature-based recreation has a huge uh, upside in terms of, of public health, uh, both for young and older people. Uh, that That's a, a quick place to make the case. Um, the real estate numbers speak for themselves. If your waterway is uh, dead, your um, your waterfront property is is less valuable. Uh, so that those are those are two places. Um, as far as the talking about the, you know, the positive emotions, um, I've had a few people say, uh, ask me if I thought by emphasizing the positive, if I thought that would undermine our ability to use fear and guilt to motivate people. And I thought the question itself was telling um, and indicative of, of one of the places the environmental movement is, is kind of stuck. Uh, and I, I understand that fear and guilt are, are, are good motivators sometimes, uh, at least on, on a short run. Uh, and, and I'm not saying this is a, a positive emotions just completely replace those, those useful emotions. Um, but I think it's a yes and um, approach that we, we want to use positive uh, messaging and, and emotions uh, where possible and where it makes sense. And sometimes fear is appropriate. Sometimes we should uh, run quickly away uh, from a situation, and that's the right response. Uh, and sometimes we should stay and, uh, and fall more deeply in love with, with our place. Uh, and and not run. So, um, I you know really like point. most things. It usually the um, answer is a yes. I was hoping and, you could talk a bit answer, about the power of the sound associated with water. an either or conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I when I first started looking at um, rain on water. Um, as a scientist, the, you know, the thing you do is you break everything apart into its components, and I sort of broke it down into the multiple senses that we have. And, and one of the most obvious places to begin uh, is the sound and, and the, what the sound of water does for us. And it turns out there's not a whole heck of a lot of research from, uh, from, from the neuroscience side on our brains on, on the sound of water. But what there is is a, a whole lot of work on uh, our brains on music. So that, those were that's where I found some of the dots to connect. And it turns out that certain certain rhythms and certain tones are are sort of fundamentally and universally appealing um, to the human brain, and others are are disturbing or you know more erratic sounds or uh, are uh, disruptive or distracting. And so I was able to kind of talk to some of those scientists, invite them to our conferences, and, and pick their brains and have them speculate a bit. Uh, but certainly the, the sound of water um, in the right place at the right time is, is appealing. So, it, you know, the sound of a drip while you're trying to sleep may be uh, uh, not so soothing. And you may be thinking, okay, where is that drip? And is it going to drip on me? And do I, do I have a leak somewhere? And is there going to be mold in my floorboards? Uh, but water in the right place at the right time is, is incredibly soothing. And that's something that we, we can understand as we, um, you know, from a healthcare perspective, uh, from an urban design, from an architectural perspective, um, really sort of close to home. My daughter, Julia, is, uh, is 10 years old, and over the, the majority of those 10 years, she's lived through California drought conditions. Uh, but in the earlier years, the creek that runs by her house ran much more full. So she fell asleep every night to the sound of the creek. Uh, it's called Mill Creek. And the water we drink comes from Mill Creek. And now Mill Creek is much lower, and particularly in the summertime, but even now in the wintertime. 
the flow is much lower, so the sound is quieter. And she, to get to sleep, puts on a, a sound app. And it, it kind of breaks my heart in a way, but it's also a really interesting situation that she needs to listen to the sound of the creek. So she listens to an electronic creek in order to fall asleep uh, many nights, even though Mill Creek is right outside her, her window. Off and the top of your head, kind of personal level could you of, of give any um, suggestions really for cities or projects or programs or policies that are exemplary models that people could use to replicate in their own communities? I think some, some of the things that are going on, I mentioned Pittsburgh, and uh, some of the things that are going on in Pittsburgh are really exciting because their, their city uh, is really, really shifting from turning, having its back turned to its rivers to turning around and, and facing the rivers. And you see that architecturally, you see that socially, uh, you see that in the, the nonprofits that are popping up, uh, groups like River Life that are are engaging uh, the community with life on the river. Uh, and it goes from, from the schools, from the green schools programs to, uh, to the development that's occurring along the riverfront, to the public spaces that are being created so that people can gather uh, for special events. People are holding weddings uh, along the river. Um, and you know, really, 20 years ago, that notion was laughable. Um, and people would really, the idea of going to the river and having a paddle or um, going to the edge of the water to propose to someone uh, was, was an absurd idea. And now it's, it's happening. So I, I think Pittsburgh is a great case study. And there are lots, lots of other cities around the world that are, are doing the same thing. And, you know, the Danube River and the Seine and the Thames, um, yeah, I mean, it's really happening all over the U.S. and all around the world. There are examples of um, uh, people bringing their rivers and their, their waterways back to life. I think Boston, the Boston Harbor, has, has had a, a tremendous amount of investment in cleaning it up. Still a long way to go, but things, are, things along the waterfront uh, are beginning to change. And there's even a, a medical center built um, at extra cost uh, along, along the harbor. And... Uh, the, you know, the, the data is not completely conclusive yet, but the, um, uh, the directors of the center are already saying that they see the benefits in, uh, in patient care, in the response time, the, the healing rates, and the, uh, the attitude of, of the staff. Uh, the doctors and nurses and staff are, are happy to be by the water. And that return um, will eventually come back uh, in terms of the economics of the project, they they believe, uh, and you know, and this is not a um, you know you get the the California cliche sometimes that oh you know touchy feely, let's hug and and here's a blue marble kind of uh, cliche or attitude, but you know this is Boston, and uh, <laughs> having spent a lot of time in Boston, and you know it's definitely there's a different vibe, and. Um, you know, so we're seeing we're seeing these ideas catch on and and make sense economically when when all the different factors are. Well, Dr. Considered. Nichols, thank you a, so much for sharing your work with us. Um, I had the Harbor fortune of attending your lecture at UVA last year, and I really appreciated your question: What is your water? And how inspiring it was to see how people opened up when they spoke about the water that was important to them or their in their childhood. Uh, so we're really glad that you and your research team are working to remind people just how important water is. Great. Thanks a lot. And I'm really looking forward to um, the continued collaboration. And I want to mention that, that Tim Beatley will be giving the, uh, the keynote uh, at the, the fifth Blue Mind Summit, which is coming up May 11th in Washington, D.C. And the theme of it is Urban Blue, which is a, 
a bit of a riff on Tim's book, Blue Urbanism. So Great. Well, thank really you. Excited about and I uh, also thank you to our uh, listeners. Join us Wednesday, April 1st, for Robin Moore's webinar, Greening Urban Childhood.